I wanted to show the car in this sort of context of this kind of wild, beautiful location. It was really uh, the car in the location and the size and the shape and sort of how it related to the landscape. Sometimes the car was large, sometimes the car was small, but it's such a beautiful sort of object. It was a pleasure to uh, be able to not only uh, you know drive it, but also to photograph it in this spectacular landscape. Changing Lanes, the official podcast of BMW. Welcome to this episode of Changing Lanes, the official podcast of BMW. I'm Jonathan Tilley, and today we've got a very special guest, Steve McCurry. Born in Philadelphia, studied at Penn State University, Steve took a trip to India with a bag of clothes and his camera and got out of his comfort zone, like way out of his comfort zone. After a few short months of traveling, he crossed the border to Pakistan, where he met a group of refugees from Afghanistan who smuggled him across the border into the country just as the Russian invasion was closing the country to Western journalists. Steve emerged in traditional dress, and he sewed his film into his clothes and crossed the Pakistan border. Now, this was just the beginning of a lifelong adventure traveling to all seven continents of the world, creating unforgettable images like Afghan Girl. And to all of the podcast listeners out there, you've definitely seen this image. Afghan Girl appeared in the June 1985 cover of National Geographic. Now, this image is of an adolescent girl who has piercing green eyes and a red headscarf looking intensely at the camera. This image was named the most recognized photograph in National Geographic magazine's history and became a symbol of Afghanistan to the West. With books like In Search of Elsewhere, Animals, Steve McCurry, A Life in Pictures, India, the unguarded moment, Steve McCurry untold the stories behind the photographs, exhibitions all over the world, and tons of awards. Steve McCurry's imagery has a juxtaposition of fragility and danger that captures the human condition, and Steve has taken some truly iconic photographs for BMW. Steve traveled yet again, this time to the serene but fierce and untamable Scottish Highlands, where the BMW iX was not merely a means of transportation for Steve and his crew, but found its own way before his lens as he documented it with the landscapes, a new challenge for someone who has primarily made his name shooting people and places. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to be with you. <laughs> so probably there are not that many people listening to this podcast who have not heard of you yet, but I'd still like to give you the chance to introduce yourself and tell us what's your motivation, what drives you. Well, I've been a photographer for a few decades. I, my main passion is traveling and exploring the world that we live in, meeting people, different cultures, different ways of life, and uh, just basically documenting the world that we live in. This has kind of been my passion for many years. I've I've traveled to most places that I've I've wanted to go to. Yeah, um, and. Uh, the last trip I made to Scotland was very inspiring. You know, I yeah I have a Scottish blood in my veins, <laughs> uh, among other things. So it was it was kind of a thrill to go back to uh, this part of the world where some of my ancestors once probably I don't know lived in caves or uh, <laughs> were farmers or shepherds or whatever. Uh, it's a stunningly beautiful area and um the unpredictability of the weather only made it more sort of uh fascinating <laughs> yeah yeah totally so i mean other than the rich history of scottishness being in your blood um what's your relationship to these highlands that you were in in scotland how is that photographing there i've always been drawn to mountains and hilly areas uh you know the whether it's the you know the Himalayas or a mountain range in um, Australia or uh, Russia. This particular area is kind of very sparsely populated. So it's it feels a bit wild. Um, and you feel as though you're sort of discovering this area. The mountains, there's 
the streams, the the flora and fauna. It's it's just a beautiful and you know even the the rain, the wind, the cold. I don't know. It sort of enhances the experience somehow. I would probably prefer to work in a sunny, warm place, but uh, <laughs> the combination of the terrain and this sort of empty wilderness, mm. it kind of made it more exciting somehow. Now, for this journey that you took, I mean, like you said, with the weather changing all the time, um, how do you prepare for this? Do you have an, an idea? Do you visualize how you want your photos to look? Or is there a more spontaneous approach? Can you walk us through that process? Well, I'd like to have a sort of a basic knowledge of where I'm going to go to, where I'm traveling to. But I want to keep an open mind. I don't want to over-prepare too much and sort of, um, you know, kind of be disappointed because I have have some expectation or some sort of preconceived idea. I knew it was going to be a bit chilly there, so I took a you know, rain jacket and gloves, a hat and all that. But, uh, you know... Uh, Apart from that, I just uh, I always try and travel very in a very minimal way, uh, just kind of basic camera equipment, and then you know just enough clothes to kind of get me through the journey. Yeah, but um, I travel very light, I think. That was going to be my next question. You know, the very first time that you began this adventure where you just packed some clothes and went to India and you're still doing that. You're packing very light and you take minimal equipment. So. I'm dying to know. And one of the most often questions of photographers is what gear do you use? So instead of asking exactly that, how do you decide what to bring and what to leave at home, especially if you are traveling so minimalistically? Well, I have a couple like this. So I have a backup in case there's a problem, you know, if it gets, I drop it in a stream or whatever. Yeah. So I have a redundancy in my equipment. And I, I, I want to pack some warm clothes and then some uh, clothes for a hot day and some clothes, some cold weather, and then some rain. Uh, I maybe take a book to read. Um, and that's that's pretty much it. That's all I, I take. Um, most of what I have really is, is equipment, cameras, hard drives, uh, tripod, um, and... Uh, few extra lenses that's pretty much uh pretty much it i've traditionally just worked with kind of one lens or or maybe two lenses and that's pretty much the extent of my kind of photo gear yeah what lens what's your go-to grab gear well i like the uh the 24 to 90 zoom uh there's another like a lens which is a, like a um a 16 to 35 so mm-hmm. I can kind of cover everything that I need. I have a longer lens, which goes out to 290 millimeters, but I, I generally just work in that small range. And I've done that for years. I, I, everything I see is basically within that range of 24 to, to 90. Wow. Fantastic. Now, you also have photographed wind parks. So why here? What's the story you're trying to tell us here with these with these wind parks amongst all the amazing photography that you do? I think the planet needs to find, you know, alternative energy sources. I think wind and solar and and uh, some capturing energy from waves. Uh, I think, you know, before we just completely implode yeah. <laughs> and, and disintegrate ourselves because uh, certain parts of the world have a kind of, a, you know, rich in wind. I, I think it's great in the case of where we were in Scotland to use this, you know, to power our, our cities and, and whatnot. Um, so I, I think this is something that we absolutely have to do. We don't really have uh, much alternative at this point is something we just have to make happen. So I was very happy that we're able to photograph um, a couple of those on this journey. That's amazing. I think there's a parallel between, you know, using the film and then switching on over to digital and how we've all had to adapt especially in the in the photography world, but also now with sustainability how we have to adapt to different 
resources of energy. And I love how you're just diving in with wind and solar and documenting that as well. And also documenting the car. Can you share with us a few thoughts on how it was to work with such a subject like a car when you're so used to working with subjects like people? And how did you decide on the right way of doing it? Well, I wanted to show the car in this sort of context of this kind of wild, beautiful location. And so it was really uh, the car in the location and showing the the size and the shape and sort of how it related to the landscape. Sometimes the car was large, sometimes the car was small, but it's such a beautiful sort of object. It was a pleasure to... Uh, be able to not only uh, you know drive it, but also to photograph it in this spectacular landscape. Yeah, which you excel at on so many levels. Your imagery of landscapes is just breathtaking. So, I mean, we know you love working with humans and doing portraiture, and it's iconic. And with the differences between portraiture with humans and photographing landscapes, what are the similarities? What are the differences that you've noticed in your extensive career? Well, with landscapes, I try and put in some emotional component into it. I want it to kind of come alive and I want it to make us uh, feel some emotion like a portrait. I mean, I think the best portraits are ones that kind of evoke some kind of a feeling empathy or some kind of uh, connection. I think in photography, what's memorable is having the photograph take us on a journey, take us somewhere and um, make us feel something, laughter or happiness or sadness or joy or whatever. So I think that's kind of where I want to take, especially with portraiture and with landscape, I think you want to have something which, you know, you look at it and you think, wow, yeah, I want to be there. I want to go there. And uh, I think that's kind of the point of landscape. I mean, it has to be interesting. It has to be dramatic. It has to take your breath away. And I think that's where you want to go and yeah. Landscape photography. And I mean, I think anybody can take a picture of a mountain or a picture of a sunrise or a picture of clouds. But there's something about, like you said, storytelling and bringing that emotion into it that makes people go, oh, I want to go there. Or I feel like I'm there when I look at that. So mm -hmm. with this vision that you have, why do you think people love your photos? What makes you and your work stand out from from the rest? Well... That's a good question. I think pictures, paintings, photographs, I think they need to be often about something. I think that the pictures have to communicate. Sometimes in photography, a body of work is too personal to the photography and mm. people can't relate to it. I always try and strive to make pictures which uh, communicate, which I think uh, tell a universal story which uh, I think people kind of respond to because of that emotional component. Um, but um, yeah, it's just sort of uh, uh, trying to make pictures to communicate. Yeah. Now, I mean, looking back when you first started, I'm just blown away by your gumption, your let's get up and go to India and travel and, and here we go. Looking back when you first started out, what was one thing that you maybe wish you would learn sooner? Or was it just let's go and have an adventure? Well, I think looking back, I wish I would have photographed more just my daily life. Sometimes uh. you're you're going someplace to some epic location yeah, I just wish I had photographed, uh, you know, my hotel rooms or the, or um, you know, the vendors along the side of the road. Sometimes I was kind of waiting for the epic event, and uh, actually, I don't have any regrets. I think I I got it about right. And um, in life, you know, it's just kind of you have to go for the percentage. You know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. <laughs> And I just tried to uh, do the best I could, but I, I think it worked out okay. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. I think so too. So <laughs> for the budding photographers out there, you know, talking about looking back and when you first started, 
what was something that you wish you would learn to do sooner? And you saying, you know, taking more pictures of daily life. Is that something that you would pass on to budding photographers to just start, take more pictures of everything? Or how can one work towards defining their photography style or things that they should avoid? Yeah, one thing which seems really obvious is you really have to work a lot and you have to work often and perhaps every day you need to be involved. It has to be kind of part of your life. And as the, you know, the years go by and you've shot, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of images, you start to develop sort of a style. You, your personality comes out in your pictures, but it takes a lot of dedication and a lot of passion. But particularly, you have to love what you're doing. And um, it takes a lot of uh, persistence, uh, fortitude. Uh, I think you need to look at other work. I've learned so much from looking at, you know, the work of, you know, the various masters and how they approached, whether it was portraiture or landscape or light or composition. And uh, by studying these other masters, I've been able to sort of incorporate some of what I've learned from them into my own into my own work. I think yeah. we all learn from each other. Exactly. Being inspired by others, seeing what they do and try and bring that into your own creative flow. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So in the beginning, when we were speaking about Scotland and how you're inspired by nature and you see everything happening and the, and the windmills and sustainable energy and everything. So you have been out in the field for so long. What's your relationship to nature? And over those years, have you seen nature change in any ways? Well, I think the wilderness areas in the world have been so greatly reduced. I think of some of the parts of Africa, some of the game parks, which have seemed to be getting smaller and smaller. I think of the Himalayas and some of the grandeur and some of the areas there shrinking. Um, but I think my happiest moments have been in a wilderness setting and to be able to really appreciate nature uh, mm. and to just be there alone, hear the sound of uh, you know the birds or look at the mountains on the beach and just uh, be grateful that we're alive and able to enjoy this incredible world that we we live in. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't think it gets any better than that. You know, that feeling that you're describing, you know, is that that obviously has some way of channeling through you into the images that you take and you want to tell that story as well. I think you mentioned it that, you know, the nature or the forests are getting smaller. Have you noticed a change, a radical change in specific areas where the environment is being dramatically affected? Well, if you travel through the Sahel region of Africa from Senegal through Mali, Niger, Chad and Sudan, you can really see the degradation of the some of the grasslands and some of the desertification, which has sort of taken hold in large part, I would suppose, by uh, global warming. And, uh, you know, again, traveling in the Himalayas and going up to some of these mountainous areas of Nepal and the Tibetan region and, and see how some of the glacier areas and some of the erosion has uh, kind of decimated whole regions of mm. that area. So. Um, yeah. yeah, it's quite disturbing. And you kind of wish that we could sort of somehow rectify it and do better. But that's going to take some time. And I don't know if we have time. <laughs> True. Good that you're also documenting, for example, the windmills and that you're so passionate about uh, alternative sources of energy. That's really great to hear. For someone that has traveled all over the world, and I'm wondering, I'm curious, are there any areas that you love returning to or are there any areas that you haven't been to yet that are maybe on your bucket list? I'm pretty sure you've been probably everywhere, but who knows? There might be a corner of the earth that you haven't seen yet. Well, I always look forward to going back to that Himalayan region, mm. which I've mentioned a couple of times, you know, Bhutan and Tibet and Ladakh and India and uh, parts of uh, Nepal, 
I love Burma. Unfortunately, they have a, a some political unrest there now. But that's that area. Uh, I've always been drawn to uh, Buddhist cultures, particularly in sort of Southeast Asia. But um, I love uh, always returning to Italy. I've traveled through many regions of Italy, and um, it, you know they have this incredible art everywhere, and the landscape and the food and everything. So that's um, an area which I go back to quite often. And uh, you know, one of my favorite places is Ethiopia. Incredible terrain, beautiful people, and uh, they still retain so much of their culture, as does a place like Yemen. Yeah, you know, the world is uh, always in flux, always moving. And, you know, one country's open, then it closes. And uh, unfortunately, Yemen's another case of, uh, because of upheaval there, it makes yeah. it difficult to travel. But uh, incredible people and uh, just a magical place. Amazing. You've seen so much. You've seen so much and photographed so much as well. With your relationship to nature and especially being who you are and sharing your story through the lens, what role do you think that photography in general or more specifically your photos can teach us that aren't traveling all over the world like you about nature? What can photography teach us about nature and how we can try and help it? Well, I think photography can make a contribution, maybe a small contribution, but I think we all have to try our best and uh, do what we can. I think showing, on the one hand, the beauty of nature and the, the treasures that this world holds, but also show some of the problems and some of the need for change and with water and air and the oceans. So I think if we can you know, educate people about what's happening in the world. Hopefully that will affect some kind of action or change. Again, I think to be realistic, there's a limit to what photography can do, but I think every, every bit helps. Yeah. Wise words, wise words from a man that's seen the world 10 times over, has photographed on all seven continents and has seen the rise and fall of so many different emotions, whether it be landscapes or portraiture. And thank you so much, Steve, for being part of the podcast. It's been an absolute honor to have you on, on the show. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our podcast listeners for listening in to this week's episode of Changing Lanes. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you subscribe for our future podcast episodes. And to dive deeper into all things BMW, head on over to BMW.com to learn more. I'm Jonathan Tilley, and this has been Changing Lanes. See you next time.